So what are we to make of GMOs? Are they the root of health problems and environmental damage, or could they be the revolution in food and agriculture that helps solve world hunger? Joining us now is Val Giddings. He's senior fellow at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Why don't you help frame this argument? Uh, because th this is kind of a heated debate, isn't it? Uh, it is, and it's been uh, going along and cycling in ups and downs for the better part of uh, two, almost three decades. Uh, but there's a lot of misunderstanding. I mean, the term itself is misleading. Uh, as a geneticist, I don't like the term uh, because the word also falsely suggests uh, that, um, that we think of as conventional artified. The fact is that everything that appears on a dinner plate, virtually any place on the planet, has been genetically modified through thousands of years of artificial and natural selection. Mm, interesting. <coughs> well, we're going to be looking at this in this segment all week long, and there are 10 products in particular that we're going to focus on and people opposed to GMO warn against. And we have a graphic here to talk about the 10. Uh, cotton, soy, corn, zucchini, sugar, papayas, dairy, aspartame, canola, and yellow squash. Um, do you feel like some are more dangerous than others, or, or what are your thoughts? Well, uh, you know, that list that you just gave was a mix of crop varieties and of products. Uh, I'm familiar with all of those, and none of them uh, as genetically modified uh, crop varieties or as ingredients uh, pose any risks different from those that we're familiar with uh, from the products of conventional plant breeding. Mm. Uh, these crops and foods have been subjected to more scrutiny in advance in depth and detail than any others in history. They have been consumed in billions upon billions of meals by humans and livestock animals around the world, and there has been not even as much as a sniffle uh, linked to the fact that they've been produced through the genetic modification techniques that, uh, that we now use today. There are some groups who <coughs> want this labeled, um, and there's been a push against that. Uh, a lot of the people in the business sector say hey, it's going to cost a lot of extra money. It's not really needed. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the labeling issue is particularly complicated. Uh, <coughs> it, you know, on its, on its face, who could be against sharing information? Nobody. Uh, but, you know, for myself, there, uh, I have a personal interest in this. Uh, um, the existing law in the United States requires that food labels be accurate, informative, and not misleading. And that information relevant to the health, safety, or nutrition of the food, that's required to be on the label. Uh, and my son has a peanut allergy. So I want to make sure that the information on a label tells me whether or not there are peanut-derived materials in it. Uh, and, you know, that's absolutely essential for his safety. Uh, and the label system that we have in place today would do so. What the advocates of so-called labeling for GMOs uh, want is a label that says GMO, whether or not there is in fact any difference in the ingredients that are used in these food items, and regardless of whether or not there are any implications for health, safety, or nutrition. In point of actual fact, uh, we, we have uh, abundant data to show that foods derived from these crops are safe, when there is a material change in composition relevant to health, safety, or nutrition, the Food and Drug Administration requires that that be on the label today. And consumers who wish for whatever reason of ideology or, or pecuniary self-interest want to avoid these foods, they have multiple options to choose something else. Do you think uh, that it's not much of an issue then? I mean, it, it, to most consumers, do you think that they don't really much care about this? Or do you think that there's, there's just a significant group that are pushing for this? I mean, how do you see this in the landscape? Well, there is a significant group pushing for this. Um, and there are some folks who have concerns. Uh, but in terms of the general public, uh, we know that uh, when they are asked unprompted what information is not found on food labels today that you'd like to have on food labels tomorrow, uh, a minuscule fraction suggests that they want information related to GMOs. We know that at the height of a food recall scare over a, uh, a, a GMO that was found in foods where it should not have been uh, some years ago, that the number one question that, the, that, that customers asked uh, when they called the toll-free, you know, call this number line, was not, is this dangerous, but when will this product be back on the shelf? We know that consumers, by and large, aren't concerned about this. We know there's a small, very noisy contingent that has their own self-interest and ideological reasons for opposition, uh, but they're not based on any findings related to health, safety, and nutrition. Where does it go from here when we look at the world <laughs> landscape? Uh, where do you see GMOs going? Well, 
uh, they're rapidly on track to become the new conventional standard. Um, about 79% of the corn or maize grown on the planet today uh, is of these new varieties produced through biotechnology. Uh, about 70% of the soy, uh, I'm sorry, about 79% of the soybeans, about 70% of the corn, uh, a third of the cotton, a quarter of the canola. Uh, these biotech improved crops uh, are already uh, a major part of world agriculture and move in, in global trade around the planet. Uh, and uh, they've added uh, 100, 100 billion dollars in farm gate value uh, uh, to, uh, to farmers' profits uh, over the past uh, two decades. They're grown in 27 countries by 18 million farmers. These things are here to stay. Well, I was going to say, that's, uh, that seems to be the message coming through loud and clear. Val Giddings, thank you for stopping by, sir.